This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options from other companies, so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify. The global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Welcome to Dear Prudence. I'm your prudence, Janae Desmond-Harris. Today, we'll be offering advice on how to get over a crush on someone you never actually dated, what to do about a fiance's sneaky candy bar habit, and how to cope when your best friend's secret social media reveals that she's an unapologetic bigot who hates pretty much everyone. Joining me today is Jenna Wortham, a journalist who works as a culture writer for the New York Times Magazine, hosts the podcast Still Processing, and is an editor of the visual anthology Black Futures. In addition to all that, they're also a sound healer, Reiki practitioner, herbalist, and community care worker oriented toward justice and liberation. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Long time listener, first time guest. Very excited. I'm so excited to have you on. And I can't wait to ask you before we get started for one piece of unsolicited advice that you just really (gasps) want to get off your chest. Whoa, what do I want to pop off? Oh my gosh. Okay, okay, okay. What's coming up for me though, because I'm in the desert is put electrolytes in your water. Hmm. Like you're not getting as much hydration as you think you are. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, whatever it is, squeeze a lemon, a little bit of salt, you know, a little packet. I don't know, but put electrolytes in your water. Okay, I really needed to hear that. I don't know why, like, I knew other people used electrolytes, but it never occurred to me that I should. I think I thought they were for if you worked out really aggressively, but we should all be doing it. That's what I thought too, but now I'm starting to recognize that it's just generally dry and we're just drinking, well, I don't know, I have a Stanley Cup, I'm out myself as a Stanley Girly Pop, but Mm -hmm. even, like, I'm drinking all this water all day long and I'm not feeling hydrated, and I think this is why. This might really help me. Thank you for this. My pleasure. I'm starting today. I can't wait to be better (laughs) hydrated. Jay and I will dive into your questions after a short break. Can't get enough Dear Prudence? Then you should definitely join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. You'll get to hear me answer an extra question every week just for members. With your subscription, you get ad-free listening across the Slate network and unlimited reading on the Slate site, including all Dear Prudence columns, past and present. Go to slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. Again, that's slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverage you want like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. 
Welcome back. You're listening to Dear Prudence, and I'm here with Jay Wortham. Let's get started with our first letter. It's titled, Still Crushing. How can I get over someone who I never even dated? I'm 25 and still have weird feelings about Talia, a girl I had a crush on in high school. She and I were two very few out queer girls in our grade. I was well-liked, but certainly not popular, while Talia was considered one of the coolest people in the class. We were moderately good friends, but I mostly remember being intimidated by her effortless coolness and somewhat annoyed that she was so smart without really trying. At that time, I was bending over backwards to be perfect at school, at home, and in my extracurriculars. I had a major crush on her for pretty much all of high school, but never made a move, mostly because of how cool I thought she was. I did date a different girl briefly, but I honestly didn't like her as much as I liked Talia. After graduation, Talia informed me that she had always kind of liked me. This was not only shocking to me, but also made me feel so dumb for never putting my feelings out there. It honestly made me mad that she never told me this when we had a chance to do something about it. I moved away for college and never looked back, and I'm no longer friends with anybody from high school. Talia and I haven't so much as texted for five years or more, although we do follow each other on social media. Now I'm in a wonderful relationship with a fantastic partner. My self-esteem is much higher than it was in high school, and my mental health, while not perfect, is so much better. Looking back, I don't think I was actually capable of being in a healthy relationship as a teenager, and I am grateful that I never got into anything messy with Talia. But it's almost like I still have a weird crush on her. I think about her often, and I scroll through her social media profile from time to time. I think about what it would have been like if we had dated and how pretty she always was to me. Even if I don't consciously think about her, I dream about her more frequently than I would like to. The dreams usually involve us talking about kissing or being in romantic situations, although I have only actually kissed her once in a dream. Sometimes I will think I'm over her, only to have a dream about her a few nights later. Do you think someone um, who's kind of draining your energy in this way should be someone who you unfollow on social media? (laughs) This is such a funny place to start. (laughs) I mean, my first question was like, what's going on in your relationship? Hmm. Like, what's up? What's tea? You know, like, are things feeling boring? Are you feeling Mm noncommittal? Like, it it seems really clear to me that this person is having a lot of fun with this fantasy. So I guess my first question is like, what purpose is the fantasy serving? Right. 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 An escape from your current life. You know, I don't know. Either an escape from your current relationship or it's, it sounds like they're saying the relationship is okay or good. So maybe just an escape from a lack of self-esteem that's been following you a little bit since high school, even if it's a lot better now. I read in a different advice column that crushes are misplaced ambition. Or that's sort of a quote that circulates and it's attributed to a Dear Polly column. Okay. I'll read you the part that it comes from. She writes, lately I'm convinced that 99% of crushes are just ambition that doesn't know where to land or what shape to take. Sadly, women in particular often struggle to give voice to their ambition. Many of us don't identify with being driven and ambitious. We struggle to connect with the idea of success because it has no human face. So we tell ourselves we're in love when really we just want more from life. I don't know if that's really true across the board, but it resonated with me here. When I was younger, I read a book about dream analysis. And the one thing I remember taking away from it was that you're not supposed to think about the actual people who appear in your dreams. It's about what they represent and the feelings that they bring up for you and what they symbolize. Mm. And here I kind of wonder if Talia symbolizes just the kind of person who you've always hoped to be letter writer, you were queer, you felt inadequate, you didn't feel cool, school didn't come easily. She was the more confident version of you. And I wonder if what you're really obsessing over is what life could have been like if your self-esteem had improved earlier and if you could have been more like her. Yeah, it's a very sliding doors moment. There's a you know an oft-quoted proverb on Instagram, provenance unknown, that is 
do I want to be you or do I want to be with you? You yeah. know, do I want to be with you or do I want to be with you? And I think yeah. so much of queerness is about unrequited feelings, like mm-hmm. figuring out who you are and where in space and place you are and how you want to be and how you want to show up. And a lot of it does come from modeling off other people or seeing mm. other examples of queerness and then feeling like, okay, that's that's the version I want to step into for now. And so maybe part of the crush is that. But I will say that as someone who, you know, as a late queer bloomer, not that our letter writer is, but I was, and people would come up to me afterwards and say, I mean, this still happens, but people will be like, oh, you know, I always had a crush on you. And mm. it's it's so hard to deal with because, yeah, like, what do you do with that misplaced energy? And is it genuine? Is it real? It's right. It's really hard to know how to process it and what to do about it. I actually think it's wrong is too strong a word, but I I don't know what the point is of going up to someone who you don't currently plan to date and saying, just so you know, I always had a crush on you. But you know, I will say that, okay, I am someone who really indulges in harmless fantasies, playful obsessions, you know, I have OCD tendencies. And one of the ways it manifests for me is constantly cycling through what ifs. Hmm. What if I had lived in this apartment? What if I was in this relationship? What if I already had kids? What if I never had kids? Like, I'm just always Mm -hmm. trying to play out scenarios to try to better prepare myself for life, even though it doesn't actually work that way. Mm -hmm. And when I get really fixated on a person, whether romantic or otherwise, and usually it's not romantic, to be honest, but I'll get really fixated on someone who I want to be friends with, or I think I should know, or I think I should have a relationship to. Sometimes the best thing to do is just to actually have coffee with that person Mm. or meet up with them for a second because it all dissipates at that moment. Like I can kind of see with total clarity that I have built this whole narrative, this entire dollhouse in my head that isn't really real. And it helps me right size the feelings that I'm having. And then I can have what I would say a more, you know, healthy distance to that person, place, or thing. The questions I also have are, where is Talia? Do they live in the same place? Mm -hmm. Is it even possible for them to interact? Is it possible for them to have a coffee? Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Because in my mind, I can imagine a scenario where they just have a coffee and letter writer is like, yeah, like I can talk to you now as an adult and also do some backwards healing for my teen self and just see that I've been putting all this energy into this idea of you that isn't Mm. really who you are, or my life is fine as it is. I don't have to fantasize or wonder about what it would be like if you dated. I can just see you as a person. I think too, one of the dangers of obsessing and fantasizing about people is that it objectifies them and it takes Mm. some of their humanity away. Like they just become objects for us to place all these ambitions or desires or dreams or wishes onto. And it sort of forgets that they are fully fleshed out humans with their own fallacies and their own desires and their own agency. And sometimes just engaging in person or over the phone or just having that interaction restores the humanity to the person. Yeah. And I think one hint that Talia was not perfect and thriving 100% of the time is that she says she had a crush on the letter writer and didn't do anything mm-hmm. about it. So right. that's not the behavior of a super confident, super cool, super evolved person. She was also holding True. back for some reason. True. So it just might be interesting to think about the fact that she looks perfect to you, but she did have her own insecurities. Exactly. And she's a flawed human like the rest of us. It never would have occurred to me. You know, I started off with like block her on social media and let's get past <laughs> this. And your advice is the opposite, but... I kind of like your advice of trying to meet up and see her in the flesh and talk to her and realize that she's a regular, flawed human. I kind of can imagine that taking the feelings down a notch. Mm -hmm. I think that in combination with doing some introspection, maybe some journaling about Mm -hmm. if this isn't about Talia the human, is it about what she represents? And if so, what is that? Wanting to feel cool, wanting to feel confident, wanting to feel secure in my queerness, wanting to feel accepted. Um, And how can I move toward those things a little bit in my life in ways that have nothing to do with my current relationship or dating her or anyone else? Totally. I mean, I I sort of see it as a decision tree. 
the decision one is I want to rid myself of this obsession. I want to move past it. And then I think Mm -hmm. your advice is perfect. Block on social media, do some introspection, maybe go to therapy, maybe do some inner child, inner teen healing work, Mm -hmm. be in service, like help a friend move, like just do whatever you can to take your mind off of things. But if you feel like there's something here I need to work through and I feel like I have the capacity to do it, then I think option number two of like trying to engage to me feels like it could potentially be really cathartic. But I want to know, do you think that the letter writer should tell their partner if they go meet up with Talia? Ooh, I think yes. If I mean, it depends on the nature of the relationship. If it's a healthy mm-hmm. relationship where they can be honest and the partner can understand nuance and the letter writer can say, I had this big crush and I find myself obsessing over her still and I know that we're happy in our relationship and I know it's not that I want to leave you but I feel like I need to meet with her to just sort of put a bow on this and put it away or learn something from it is that cool I think that would be great but only the letter writer knows her partner could be someone who becomes insanely jealous and then you have a whole nother set of problems on your hand You're listening to Dear Prudence, and when we come back, we'll be reading more of your letters. Stay with us. One in five Americans have learn a new language on their bucket list. If that's you, make 2024 the year you finally check it off the list with Babbel. I've found it really easy to learn things like ordering food and all the little things that you have to do when you're traveling that if you get them wrong, you end up feeling really awkward and embarrassed and like a horrible tourist. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get 50% off a one-time payment for a lifetime Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash prudy. Get 50% off at babbel.com slash prudy, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash prudy. Rules and restrictions may apply. We need to talk about friendship. Hi, I'm Courtney Martin. And I'm Carvel Wallace, and we host a show from Slate called How To, where real people bring us their problems and we find the wisest people we know to give them advice. This month, while everyone's a buzz about Valentine's Day and romantic love, we're going to give friendship the attention it deserves. That's right. We love friendship, and we're going to help you find friends in unexpected places, evolve your friendships, and recover from those terrible friend breakups. Uh, Friendship is central to our joy, our resilience, even our health. So join us as we talk friends together. Search for Slate's How To wherever you listen. Welcome back to Dear Prudence. I'm here with my guest, Jay Wortham, to answer your letters. And the next one is titled, Conflicted in Candyland. Several nights a week, my fiancé will sneak away to the garage and eat anywhere from five to ten candy bars in a sitting. He does his best to hide this from me, buying the candy separate from our normal grocery runs and only going to the garage when I'm asleep or otherwise preoccupied. But I still catch it sometimes, and he admitted to doing it three to four nights a week when I asked. This has been ongoing for at least two years. I have no clue how to talk to him about it. The few times I've seen him in the act, I've tried to be casual and set the tone that this is nothing serious or bad. Oh, hey, just taking out the trash. Don't forget to do the dishes when you come back in. He seems ashamed of it, and I don't want to add to that shame or make him feel he can't talk to me. On the other hand, I fear this habit isn't sustainable mentally or physically. It does not seem to make him feel good when he does it. 
The one time I brought it up, I said I was worried that he felt the need to cover up his behavior, that there was nothing wrong with eating candy, and I wondered why he felt the need to eat in the garage. He said he wasn't sure and chalked it up to, I always hid my candy from my siblings as a kid, so now I prefer to eat it in private, before admitting he was maybe a little guilty. I suggested he talk to his therapist about the guilt, and he agreed. That was six months ago, and nothing has changed. If I'm being honest, I don't really want to watch him eat all his candy in the house. I think it would add to the worries I have about this habit. But I love this man, and I want him to feel great physically and mentally. Any advice on how to engage without making him feel worse? Or should I just let it be? So, letter writer, I absolutely understand why this is concerning to you. Especially the part, you don't think this is making him feel good. Your partner seems to be maybe suffering in some way or doing something that might lead to suffering in some way. And it's really tough. I think your response so far has been perfect. You said, hey, I've noticed this. Do you know why you're doing it? Maybe talk to your therapist. This is all good and reasonable. But I guess the question is, you didn't get the result you wanted. So now what? Which leads me to another old piece of relationship advice. Everyone has their shit and you just have to decide whose shit to deal with. I think putting this in in a little perspective, I mean... I want that on a pillow. I love that. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if just something a friend told me once. But in a world in which people are cheating, lying, being abusive, being cruel, refusing to pull their weight, um, dealing with addiction, not dealing with addiction, I wonder if we need to be that worried about some secret candy bars. What do you think? Okay. So the first thing I wrote down... And then I had to look up the author's name. But the first thing I wrote down was a book recommendation. Hmm. The book is called Codependent No More Hmm. by queen icon, self-help guru, Melody Beatty. Okay. And this book is a gem for anyone who is really struggling with feeling like other people's business is their own. I know that when you're in a long-term relationship or even married, you know, that kind of happens, that kind of melding of life and agency and desire and shared outcome comes together. And also, I think maybe the letter writer could do a little bit of self-work to distance their husband's, you know, situation from themselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's really honest and real to be worried about other people's health and mental, physical, emotional. And I also sometimes think we use that as a code word when we don't approve of someone's behavior. Hmm. And I'm, I'm saying that because I don't, we don't actually know what's going on with the husband. This is sort of what the letter writer is. This is their impression of what they think is happening and what they think the behavior is, what they've witnessed. And I'm not discrediting it. I think it's also just really hard to know when people are engaging in behavior that seems compulsive or obsessive or maybe disordered what to do and actually what's happening. And I think the best thing to do is to sort of figure out why you're trying to manage it yeah, and just try to support whatever this person's going through. Because if they've seen a therapist, it's been six months, they're probably going to need something different. Right. And I, I think a really good strategy could be to sort of try to figure out how to separate the husband's behavior from the letter writers. Yeah. And that book might be a really good place to start. Yeah. So I haven't read the book and I should because I'm sure it would be useful in response to so many of the letters I get. But tell me if this connects to anything in there. I had the thought that the letter writer should step in when the behavior begins to affect her. Mm. So when she's saying we're not spending any time together because you're in the garage for two hours every night when we could be watching Netflix or you're so sluggish and tired from eating all the sugar that Mm -hmm, we're not able mm -hmm. to go out and do stuff on the weekends. Or you've developed diabetes and now we have to pay for this expensive medication. Yes. I would wait for something that actually affects you in a negative way. And at that point, you sort of have more standing to push for a change. But if your stance is that you're just worried about him emotionally... I think being sort of um, antagonized or scrutinized by your partner could actually be really emotionally harmful too. I also think that 
And I want to use these words really carefully because, again, I want to be really mindful that we don't actually know what's going on with the husband. But I do think food issues and things like sugar dependency or even sugar addiction is really complicated because we live in such a fat phobic world. We live in such a diet centric world. We live in a world and a culture that really organizes itself around shaming people around their habits, around their body shape and their body type, and assuming that it has everything to do with willpower and not the way that food has been engineered to be more compelling and irresistible. And that sugar does give some people a lot of really important dopamine. I'm someone who has like ADHD compulsions and sugar really helps me focus. Like it does, Mm -hmm. it it works for me in a way that caffeine works for other people. Mm -hmm. And so like around three o'clock, I'm just sort of like gummies. Like I just want Mm -hmm. gummy worms. And at that moment, I know that what's happening is my brain is trying to focus and needs a dopamine hit and sugar is the quickest Mm -hmm. thing. So I had to figure this, all these other tactics and strategies, you know, out and also talking to people who had the same thing. And I think not being met with any shaming or blaming or just like, do you know how bad sugar is for you? And I'm like, yes, my dentist tells me every year how bad (laughs) sugar is for me and my body and my teeth. I know, trust me. But what actually helped was getting empathy, compassion, and then Mm -hmm. strategies from other people to figure out like what was up with my sugar cravings and my dependency and fixation on sugar. And so I think I just want to remind the letter writer that like you were saying, it can be really harmful to try to manage these things without getting to the bigger root first. And I do think that once this starts to affect the letter writer in ways that feel undeniable, maybe even bringing in a mediator, like a couples counselor Mm -hmm. or someone who can facilitate and help relay the worry and the concern and also the desire, right? Because I'm also hearing a desire for their partner to be healthy, a desire to spend more time with this person. So to help relay some of those things in healthy ways that aren't about controlling and managing. This is Dear Prudence. We need to take a break, but when we come back, more letters from you and advice from us. Stay tuned. I'm Janae, and you're listening to Dear Prudence. Jay and I are about to tackle our last letter for the day. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. It's titled, Morning Over Everything. I'm a married gay man. I've recently learned that my dearest friend of 25 plus years, a straight woman, is fervently against everything about me. This is the person of first, the person I first came out to, the first person I called when my dear mother passed away, and more importantly, someone I've confided in for over a quarter century. This was, I thought, a lifelong bestie. A few weeks ago, some friends that I introduced her to found her secret social media account by accident, secret in the fact that she blocked quite a few people from it, but it clearly used her name. Her account espouses hate on a a many-times-a-day basis and is clearly hers. Anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-science. Basically, anti-humanity. It's all there. This isn't some polite discourse of opinions. Her feed is what hate looks like to a lot of my circle these days. And her opinions are actually harmful to my existence on so many levels. Rewinding into her feed, this has been going on for years. And looking further, she even had the gall to post an awful anti-gay meme the same night she came to our home for dinner. The weight of it all is a lot. I feel like I've introduced a snake into my friend group, even though absolutely no one blames me, and they've already cut off contact with her. My last contact with her a couple weeks ago was seemingly loving and warm, and I now completely doubt her sincerity. My world has been shaken. I feel like I should contact her to make sure she's okay, but my friends, my husband, and my family all think I should just wipe my hands clean of her. Help? I'm just so, so confused about how these views or sort of the mindset behind these views Mm -hmm. um, doesn't pop up in everyday life. Mm. So even if you're not talking about politics, I think the way in which you see the world normally just comes out, right? I know. And I'm just reviewing the letter, too. 
Okay, because in the letter it says some friends, some mutual friends found the secret social media account. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they knew. Like I I feel Mm. like there is something could just because what you're saying just is really resonating for me that how can someone keep that part of themselves so secret, especially in the last handful of years where we've gone through many tiers of an ongoing pandemic. We've gone through really tense and, you know, wild presidential elections, like the state of the world is such that if you have these beliefs, they just come out. I don't, I don't know how you mask them. So I do kind of wonder if maybe the mutuals got concerned and were like, we need to expose this person. Mm. Like there's something else I feel like that maybe happened, but I think first and foremost, when I read this, I just had so much grief and sadness. And so the first thing I want to say to the letter writer is just that I'm so sorry this happened Mm -hmm. and I hope they're okay. Yeah. And it is a betrayal at a level that is unimaginable and also really, really scary. Mm -hmm. Like this person knows so much about your life and your family, your home address. I don't know. It's it's just it, this person, if they are leading such an extreme double life, they are absolutely like a psychopath or a sociopath right. or a covert narcissist. Like I don't, right. I don't understand. And it makes you question every interaction. So every conversation you had, I mean, you came out to this person and I, I assume right? she said, I'm happy for you. I want to be right. there for you. Is there anyone special in your life? And then went home and posted anti-gay stuff. And like loved it. Yeah, I was like yeah. on Reddit. I mean, I just, and no shade to Reddit. I use Reddit for everything. But I'm just saying, I think that's where a lot of people lead. Yeah. They, they, ha- they, <laughs> they feel very free to say whatever they mm-hmm. want to say these days. But I, I think my first instinct is don't think about this woman. Take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Like there is real healing that needs to happen. There is a real grief that needs to be felt. There is real fear that needs to be processed. I mean, how much access does this woman have to your private life, to your personal information. I mean, Mm -hmm. I I just feel like you kind of have to start thinking from there. Like, what do I need to feel safe and be safe? Yeah. Forget about whether or not this woman's okay. Just take care of yourself. Go to therapy, take a vacation. I imagine it's the kind of revelation that could make you really question your own judgment. I'm not saying you should, letter writer, but I'm worried that it could make you very suspicious Of people and and have a hard time. Yeah, really distrustful. That's not where your mind needs to be when you go out and try to replace this person with another really good friend. Um, Okay, Jenna, I'm just going to make you be the one to say this because I get tired of people (laughs) telling me that I'm wrong. What what, What is your response to someone who says, well, she's always treated him well. Why does it matter what she thinks about politics? We can be friends with people who are different. That's what's wrong with our country is that people cut each other off for having the wrong views about politics. Sure. Oh, listen, we could we could be, you know, friends with people who are different all day long, but the difference here is she is not being different to his face. She is right. hiding it. And she right. knows there's something unpalatable about it, at least to this friend, or she's getting off on leading this double life. Right. But she knows she knows that these views would alienate her from this friend, right? Right. So I don't know. I mean, I think what we say to people is that our views are a collage of our values. I mean, they do represent what we think and who we are. And I, I'm all for having friendships and learning how to navigate. I don't, I don't believe in disposability politics. I don't believe that we need to throw each other in the trash because we don't see eye to eye on the same thing. I think that civility is often issued for convenience. I don't think people like having uncomfortable encounters. I don't think people know how to be in conflict. I also think in this country in particular, conflict also escalates to violence. And that mm-hmm. is really true. So it's so the fantasy or the idea that we can somehow like be neighbors with people who have different beliefs from us is a lovely one. But we also live in a country where people get shot for driving up the wrong driveway. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Not even like... You know, we we live in such a place of fear and suspicion and distrust from each other. So these are the real conditions of our situation. And it's okay to say, I generally want people to be okay, regardless of their religion or sexual orientation. I want them to be yes. able to live good lives and be treated well. And if, Human if rights. you don't, yeah, if you disagree, then I don't like you. That's okay. Yes. That's okay. People often tell you you shouldn't think that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's the most common negative feedback I get. 
is that I'm being an intolerant liberal and we need to be more accepting of other people's points of view and not cut each other off for being hateful oh in various God. ways. And I don't, I mean, I just, I just completely, completely disagree. But um, should the letter writer confront the friend or not? Maybe, but not right now. I just, right I, now. I really feel so strongly that the letter writer needs to process and heal. Like it's mm-hmm. just so painful. I think I can get on board with the idea of not confronting the friend. But when she does reach out, I think the response, the, the response doesn't even have to cover everything. It could just be, Karen, you posted this screenshot. Her name is Karen. It's Karen. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It's the, Karen. the day after we hung out. Um, obviously, you don't approve of my lifestyle. There's no space for us to be friends. You know, if it's me though, and I am a five time Scorpio, I'm just dropping the link in the chat. Like the next time she responds, I'm just sending, I'm just putting a link to her Instagram or Facebook, whatever it is. I'm just, I'm just dropping that. After almost three decades of this subterfuge, like what can she say? Like what, sh- what will she say? This person for themselves has to ask, can I be in a close, intimate relationship with someone who does not believe? in my personhood or that my full personhood deserves freedom and deserves right. every single thing that they deserve. You sort of have to know what the outcome you desire is. Do you just mm-hmm. want to say, I see you and I'm angry? Do you want an explanation? Like you just have to be really realistic about what you want and right. accept that you probably won't get it. Figure out what information this person has about you and like yeah. change it, tighten it up, do, do, do your due diligence before you contact them and confront them because- yeah. You have no idea what this person is capable of. And they could cause Clearly. real harm to you and your family. So be very, very, very careful. Definitely. And final note, absolutely do not feel guilty about bringing this person to the friend group. She's the problem. Oh, yeah. You're not. not. You. It's not yeah. your fault. It's not your fault. Okay, those are all the questions we have for this week. It's been fun and hopefully helpful. Thank you so much, Jay. My pleasure. What a delight. You can follow Jay on Instagram and Twitter at Jenny Deluxe and look out for their upcoming book, Work of Body, coming out soon. Do you need help getting along with partners, relatives, coworkers, and people in general? Write to me. Go to slate.com forward slash prudy. That's slate.com forward slash P-R-U-D-I-E. The Dear Prudence column publishes every Thursday. If you'd like to hear your question answered on this podcast, we are looking for letter writers who would be comfortable recording their questions for the show. And don't worry, you can stay anonymous. Dear Prudence is produced by Sierra Spragley Ricks and me, Janae Desmond Harris, with a special thanks to Maura Curry. Editorial help from Paola de Verona. Daisy Rosario is senior supervising producer, and Alicia Montgomery is Slate's VP of audio. I'm your dear Prudence, Janae Desmond Harris. Until next time. We need to talk about friendship. Hi, I'm Courtney Martin. And I'm Carvel Wallace. And we host a show from Slate called How To, where real people bring us their problems and we find the wisest people we know to give them advice. This month, while everyone's abuzz about Valentine's Day and romantic love, we're going to give friendship the attention it deserves. That's right. We love friendship, and we're going to help you find friends in unexpected places, evolve your friendships, and recover from those terrible friend breakups. Uh, Friendship is central to our joy, our resilience, even our health. So join us as we talk friends together. Search for Slate's How To wherever you listen.